Professor Maraj, thank you so much. I feel so humbled and privileged to have you give me some of your time like this. I'm really, really very honored. Not at all. I'm delighted to meet you. Uh, I'm very impressed with the work you're trying to uh, map. You could just tell me a little bit more about your, your journey to where you are now. And, and then we could talk a bit about the visual century. could maybe discuss some of your books, uh, in particular, Fatal Natalities and Interrogating Identity. Well, please do remember that I am of advanced age. And so there is a kind of dinosauric history to... Uh, to go into and so to put it really very very sort of in a nutshell um, I of course am also I suppose you are from I, I gathered you might be from Chatsworth in Durban yes, yes that's correct and I, I grew up I was born in Cater Manor and so our family eventually um my father's family eventually had to move to Silver Glen and Chatsworth. So I do know that the evictions and, you know, the transformation of Cater Manor itself from a much more mixed area to a bit of an Indian and African area. And then, of course, declared for white occupation. Right. Um, but that was when I was very young and we moved on to Overport. Yes. Lots of other places. And Overport was declared for white occupation. So we moved to the centre of Durban, uh, to, to um, Queen Street, to a building called Good Hope Centre. And that was largely because it was so difficult it, from Overport to go to Ridge Road, where the buses took you to the centre of Durban. It was difficult to get on the bus for the early morning buses were, there were just four or five seats allocated for non-whites at the back of the bus, Gray Street, and that connected with West Street, which was largely the big white shops area. And that beyond that was the Esplanade uh, on the edge of Durban Bay. And that is where we had to get to in order to get a ferry to go to university on Salisbury Island. It was quite a journey with all the racial barriers <laughs> of buses and areas and so on and so forth. So this is why we had to leave Overport eventually, although right. it was declared for whites for a while, and move to, well, closer to the undeclared zone for in the centre of the city, which was still yeah. under litigation for many years. Yeah. Indians hung on to... Gray Street and, and the adjacent streets because um, they kept fighting cases and appealing against it. So one of the things that deeply interested me in looking at your work was the very beautiful and very moving drawing you seem to have done at a young age of Chatsworth. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, you know, this is really interesting. And I, I kind of immediately closed my eyes and imagined you doing a very, very large set of murals of, uh, of this kind of work before you arrived at contemporary uh, Chatsworth uh, without forgetting this prehistory mm. that people had to move and move again and move yet again mm. in Durban in this kind of reshuffling there, is, there are maps that might be of interest to you that you might go to the city council archives and, yes. and look up how the Group Areas Act designated parts of Durban for different racial groups. Yeah. The first map, I think, emerges around the early 50s. You know, the uh, uh, one of the bodies of research I've been doing centers around these maps and I think you you just looking at your drawings and your your hand movements on and your, your use of pencil and rubber I thought was just so fantastically you know the fact that you have done 
Netflix um, kind of uh, deconstructions and then, you know, done oil painting. Yes. Uh, I thought that showed that there was still a deep connection with the hand, with the manual and with the artisanal in an age of digital, uh, that rub up between the these artisanal qualities of facture, of, you know, um, of, of uh, fingerprint, of the movement of the thumb and so on. These were extremely interesting as they transition and morph into the digital age, you know. We go through the age of mechanical reproduction, which of course the famous essay by Walter Benjamin, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. But of course we pass beyond that into the yes. digital age of reproduction. And maybe reproduction is not quite the word, it's the word of simulation or, yeah. and yeah. you know all sorts of other words we might want to use to describe yeah. the condition we're in to refer to that condition. And that's what I thought was extremely um, observant of you. And that to be broadly, we might call it remixology is not only a, an element in pop music and in, in hip hop and in grime and all these contemporary forms of sonic um, articulation, but they have the equivalence in visual, visual a treatment of visual images. Yeah. And that I sensed again, you were, you were moving in that direction and that's, absolutely marvelous that you you've got this this scenario of the origins of the hand and then its transformation through industrial mm. mechanical production and then of course um, the, the contemporary situation which is not just um, straightforward reproduction but reproduction where we can simulate but we can also remix and quote without using quotation marks absolutely uh, absolutely and that is a is a wonderful and interesting situation we find ourselves in uh, like normal notions of plagiarism of copying of uh, pilfering yeah. yes. of lifting these become well have to be given a new meaning they become meaningless in our time this new fluid type of media has made all of that up for grabs as it were yes. so the ideas about censorship and copyright they yes. sit uncomfortably now in this space yes. you know Indeed. and i'm sure you a professor when you're dealing with students how hard it is to get students to properly reference yes. <laughs> their work yes. and it's becoming increasingly difficult and mm. i find that the idea of referencing and and allocating um authorship is a very difficult concept for younger people uh to grasp and I think that it is directly stems from the kind of pseudo social environment of the Internet that creates this freedom of uh, narratives that can be mimetically changed and copied and shared. And it's very difficult when you come back to academics to say, actually, you can't say that somebody else has said that or that belongs. Yes. yes. Do you find that yes. is the case? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we're, in, we're straddling two quite different models or paradigms of what it means to, uh, uh, you know, to, to copy something and how we use it. The, the kind of paradigm of the individual creator and the copyright that belongs to the individual creator and that anything just pilfered from the vast pool of work going on is yes. pilfering and there is litigation involved in that exactly on the other hand at the same time there is emerging a model in digital culture which says well it's a pool of imagery that's circulating and in the swirl anything goes yes. and we're in a cut and paste kind of mentality yes. so students don't spend a lot of time i notice like older students used to in a different age 
we spend a lot of time getting immersed in someone's thinking, in reading a book from beginning to end, and, um, and, and you know, grappling with the ideas, and then, as it were, wringing the essentials out of that yes. and, and working with that. Today, we have a screen and a scroll, and we're constantly scanning for things that resemble what we feel is right in our in our, uh, the text we're putting together. So we simply cut it out and paste it. Yes. And this cut and paste mentality has superseded this immersive reading, close reading. So I think we have two very different models of literacy, two very different models of borrowing, stealing, plagiarism, and copyright. I spotted the, the fact that you were aware of this and you had a very sensitive um, reading developing on this. And I would suggest that that is something you really developed in this whole idea of the fluidity and the yes. liquidity in which we find ourselves in. Absolutely. And that would be a major contribution, not preferring one model over the other. The phenomenon of both these and the fact that they are tussling with each other, we are in that cusp as it. I like the idea, the word that you used of phenomenon, because also use the idea of complex signs, that yeah. everything that I try and unravel, I remove myself from it, whether it's pop culture, whatever, and look at it as a complex sign. How does yeah. it interact with me and how do I interact with it? You've picked on it directly from my little drawings, my silly sketches outside my window growing up in Chatsworth to these Netflix stills shows yeah. that dramatic shift in how we consume media and how the visual nature of visual itself has changed exactly. and that's where i'm trying to be in my work but yeah. i can see that as a phenomenon because i've lived through the change exactly because the wireless when i was younger was my grand listening to the radio you know yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's like coming from that place to where we are now where i'm not never without a screen me and this wouldn't have been possible a few years back me and you conversing you on one end of the planet i'm on on the other end and 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 just conversing like this so that is a phenomenon it's a very striking opening to a phd you see as you've been talking yes. it seemed to me that would make an extremely interesting opening chapter to okay. a phd because you see, it puts you right in the middle of the research story and gives you such an important role as an empirical observer of right. what you will write con uh, about conceptually and theoretically. Uh, you know, it, it's this empirical, experiential cargo that you are arriving with. Right. And, and the fact that you can put yourself, as I say, in the middle of the, the middle. research story is is quite a quite a thing now that might be slightly frowned upon by academic social science and so on yes. but i think one of the thing one of the situations we're facing is that the visual art phds mm. by practitioners is giving us a lot of elbow room to be quite experimental and daring in our thinking and we should be questioning certain uh established ways of doing research, established positions from which what is considered objective and what is considered subjective right. information is, uh, is brought together. So I think this is also a chance for you to, to speak from your life, but also to show um, how this transforms into generalizable knowledge mm. can be generalized we're not claiming universal that maybe only science can do pure science yes. because they establish general laws of nature okay. the law of gravity applies all over it it has to be universal but when we get to social science of course it's questionable mm. whether the social science can give us universal laws roughly they approach it but do not attain it in the way yes. that science does. And we in the humanities and in the arts are even further removed. We needn't think of this as a hierarchy, rather it's a spectrum. 
<laughs> it's a spectrum in which we are at a different position in the generalizable claims to knowledge that we make from our own experience. I like the idea of the spectrum rather than the hierarchy. I would say I've been studying at UNISA for a long time, and I feel the hierarchical systems, especially between science and the humanities, are very much entrenched. Within the humanities, specifically the visual arts uh, research uh, area, a feel. So Absolutely. with your student that you gave me, thank you so much for sharing Leah Porsage's work with me. She's working in that very, very uh, dynamic field of trying to pull in metaphysics and science and yes. try and do that. So do you find also that you struggle within this, this weird space within the humanities stuck between the Yes, I think these are slightly older battles maybe in Europe. Because, you know, we, we began the PhD in uh, the debates around the PhD began in the 90s. Okay. And, you know, the models that were used when I was professor here at the University of London at Goldsmiths College, then um, the university rules were just so ancient and old fashioned. And there wasn't a cultural climate in which you could get them to move on a PhD for art practice just saw it as impossible and just seemed, you know, how ridiculous, yeah. how on earth is it ever going like to fairy, It's like writing a PhD on a fairy tale or something like that. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I, up to a point, we did manage to establish something, but it was quite a conservative frame. Then I went as um, the Arnheim professor to University of Berlin, and there I was able to experiment a bit because I was also curator with Okui and Weasel of the Documenta, Documenta 11. Wonderful. So Wonderful. I was the kind of theoretical person with, uh, with the curatorial team. Uh, you might want to look at the volumes that we published around Documenta 11. Yeah. And um, that uh, there were four platforms forms we organized, okay. one in Delhi uh, of, of ideas around visual arts practice, but it was called Experiments with Truth, which is a quote from Gandhi in South Africa um, okay. that was very close to my heart to bring out how Gandhi saw uh, Satya Grah, or the yeah. idea of the struggle for truth in his first blow against the empire and the new system, that he said that we had to build a spiritual discipline. And uh, this discipline of nonviolence didn't mean that we were just passive and, you know, succumbed to it, but it was the strength of having a mental and physical resilience against um, uh, the, the, the kind of indoctrination, the kind of conversion to um, mm -hmm. a, a colonial identity and this which, is which in essence is actually not passive at all no we, not we at all. <laughs> because you had to act on the this yeah. transformation you had to you had to work hard on the business of transformation and we have obviously we do have spiritualistic um echoes in all of this, if you take the notion of transfiguration in Christianity, or you take the notion of uh, the Buddha, mean, the very word Buddha meaning the enlightenment, so the attainment to this, when you still the mind and you enter into shunyata, or the moment of experiencing uh, the void that is reality, or the Hindu notion of self-realization that you believe in this egotistic self, but actually in the end you have to realize that the self is part of a larger notion of mm -hmm. self, which mm -hmm. some people might call God, some people might call Krishna, some may call whatever, but really in, in full Indian and Indic philosophy, it just refers to that great absolute that is part of the universe. This is why you know, uh, uh, Leah Porsiga is also quite a uh, student of contemporary physics, of microphysics. 
and she was in conversation and invited to the great physics laboratory in CERN. And what is interesting is that in front of the institute, that this figure of Nataraja, you know, perhaps you do know this image in Indian art and sculpture of the uh, Shiva and Shakti, his feminine side, in this ambivalent image of male, female, uh, positive, negative in a dance, which is seen as the embodiment of the play of negative and positive and protons positive. At there. And of course, if you read great art historians like Ananda Kumaraswamy, who was uh, partly Catholic and partly Hindu, his writings on uh, Indian art are absolutely fantastic. And the Indians didn't appreciate it to begin with mm. because they thought of him as, well, you know, in those days, oh, he's a bit mixed. So he can't really be an authentic Indian. But he was, of course, a master. And precisely because of his multicultural makeup or multi-faith, multi-religious makeup, he was able to observe many uh, subtleties in cultural translations and transfigurations between cultures and the way we live the contemporary as translation. He was one of the first. I mean, I, I, I studied him of all places in Durban at, uh, in the art history department in Salisbury Island. Uh, and, and that room where we studied, uh, the art history room, which I have now called the apartheid era art history. I did, I did see that in your, um, is this, is the art history room an ongoing project of yours or it is, is it just a yes. time based? Or is it is it reconstructed in various countries in Europe uh, in, by students working what, to understand what cultural segregation means and racial segregation means but also to project how do we move beyond that to appreciate difference and not reduce it just to what we sim in a simplified way call diversity mm -hmm. and, and we'll come to that in a minute how do we appreciate the constant production of difference the life force is about the production of difference in one family you have difference of looks difference of speech difference of you know mentality difference of thinking, different gods are worshipped, yes. as, as uh, we always find it amusing in any uh, traditional Indian family. You have seven members, you have six worshipping six different gods, and you have the seventh one who has no god at all, who's uh, a non-believer. Yes. And that was the kind of notion of difference yes. that you lived with live and let live and the production of creative difference creative. which is also the the way physics thinks of uh, the universe as a constant production of difference constant dissolution of difference and constant regeneration of difference, of difference. these three forces you know either the trinity we might think of it or we might think of it as the three forms of shiva as evolution dissolution and conservation, you see. So, so we have wonderful maps given to us by the religious systems. Yes. You don't have to believe in them, but they are very visual, they are very embodied, they are very, you know, um, uh, what should one say, uh, open for, for us to engage with uh, at a human level. Yes. and beyond the abstractions of conceptual thought, yes. uh, which only few of us can attain to those, those levels, and few yes. of us can be bothered to be so scholarly about, uh, yes. about things, you see. So, um, so I think... Can I interject uh, while we're on the, the, the cosmology, yeah. the Indian... Do you, in your theoretical and conceptual approach, whether it is to art or to uh, to you know philosophy, do you always apply Indian cosmology and uh, religion into your thinking? The construct. Yes. Thinking? I have used I have used quite a lot of Sanskrit terms in order to introduce the notion of the untranslatable. 
that not all cultures can be translated and reduced to global Western Eurocentric thinking. So in order to resist that, just as much as one might resist Afrocentric thinking, just yes. as much as one would resist Indocentric thinking, we, we have to find concepts, we have to construct concepts which resist that assimilation. Yes. Otherwise, we are all drawn into and assimilated into one notion of culture, one notion of the global uh, world. Yes. And how then to retain differentiation. So this touches on one of the questions you had raised. Is our Indian uh, strand of Indianness in our makeup, is it something we should suppress further? Yes. Or is it something we might want to find a useful element mm -hmm. thinking how we keep the world open to the production of plurality of culture and experience and identity and yes. not reduce it to Afrocentric or Eurocentric or Indocentric yes. notions of uh, identity. And the way you explain it, it seems like a much richer form of identity. Yes. So, than the Eurocentric model of identity yes. in terms yes, of locality, of geographical location, whatever, it gives me an idea that identity can be a lot richer and deeper than just how you look or who you are Absolutely. where you're from when you spoke about the untranslatable i find that mm. notion so mind-blowing <laughs> mm. that that cannot be explained within the small within the narrow definitions of what our language can afford us absolutely in the visual century you spoke about the rub up between the visual and the verbal when it comes to this drift of images you call it you have such an ingenious way of creating a visual uh, of uh, you know something that's so abstract in terms of emotion in terms of philosophy so i really enjoyed that yes. small piece of writing thank you thank you for saying <laughs> that of course these things are difficult it takes a long time to you know uh, first of all master all texts and learn an analytical way of thinking and an analytical way of uh, as you say working in a scholarly way where you cite your sources and so on but as time goes on you've got to learn to produce your own voice with things and yeah. that's where you know you begin to see that you have to be a, a an artist on the conceptual level too with yes. language practice, you yes. see. Yes. And uh, the conceptual artist and the conceptual creativity is an important um, moment in the journey of our studies. The PhD is today a rung on the ladder, as it were, yes. a, a, a station on the road where we are, you know refining our thinking vis-a-vis -vis other things yes but we've we can't be captive to that forever yes. to yeah. learn to be conceptually creative yes and that's where you know we draw on other resources and other reservoirs of feeling emotion our childhood you know family experiences yes. all this comes into the way we use language eventually in durban <laughs> I had written a chapter which uh, looked at the apartheid system mm. and I had interpreted it via Heidegger and, and uh, Sartre's existentialist thinking. And I remember the report came back from Professor Oosterhuizen. I've, I've, I've lost the capacity to uh, twist my tongue around Afrikaans words. Um, uh, he he wrote to the rector of the university saying that I don't think this is acceptable because it's a veiled uh, attack on the apartheid system. So they cancelled my registration and I was thrown out for a year oh, until wow. University of South Africa, you know, there were supporters there like Walter Battis and um, Jack Grosset and all these people who were very supportive uh, managed to have me reinstated and 
wrap up my thesis and do my exhibition and, and wow. leave the country, as it were. So, um, so uh, you know, I know how difficult it is at that stage where you intuitively know that language is not able to translate these experiences into yes. words. Yes. And so you have to find another language, you have to invent mm. a language each time. And that's not permitted in academic writing. Yes. Uh, academic writing wants you to sound very sober, basically just clarify your arguments. But I think just see that conceptual creativity is going to be an important yes, dimension. Sir, does it get easier in time to be yes. that place of your own voice, as you say? Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> okay. It does, and I'll that's what you have to for it. <laughs> You no. have to believe in it and, you know, work at it, yes. I think. On the basis of what we experienced in the last century, you mm. would think that the Holocaust did not happen. The Holocaust happened when the most assimilated Jews, Jews who had renounced their faith, who believed that they were secular Germans, who were the greatest writers of Germany, who were the greatest scientists of Germany, Einstein, were stripped of citizenship and considered non-German non and kicked yeah. out of the country Absolutely. or sent to the death camp. So that was the biggest experience of how the demand for assimilation, the demand that you drop your so-called tribal roots yeah. and references, yeah. you can go, go down that road, but there comes a moment where the, the mainstream culture turns around and says, but you aren't authentically a German, you aren't authentically a South African. You are obviously from somewhere else. This will crop up. Yes. The point is to recognize this differentiation, not, yes. not to use it as an attempt to segregate things, but in order yes. to see how reality and, and, and the world is a creative force, the production of variety, the production of difference. And right. this is what is being celebrated in, of, of yes. difference. You see, it's yeah. a celebratory attitude. Yes, I like that. I like that uh, connection. So, uh, Professor, coming back to the, to the visual and the verbal, would you say that in the description, in this very kind of navigating this way out of what we now call as post-apartheid, post uh, Akwi in was, uh, says there's four modernity, would you say within the visual there is an unrestricted, unpoliticized space of artwork, as opposed to your verbal, this rub that you speak about, to the verbal, which is very politicized and yes. very treacherous in its explanation of the visual. Yes. Would you say that is the rub up that you are referring to? Yes, exactly. Okay. Perfect. Exactly. And on the day that apartheid ended in 1994, when the, when the vote was taking place, yes. that was when I gave the lecture at the Tate Gallery for the launch of the Institute of uh, International Visual Art, okay. which was a created specially to deal with notions of difference, cultural translation and, right. and diversity. And this essay is called Perfidious Fidelity. You can okay. see it's oxymoronic. It's got two opposite notions. Perfidious, a betraying loyalty that this untranslatable element in yes. the visual will always betray and be perfidious to what you put in language. So right. in language, you can come up with the biggest rhetoric about us being liberated, being black and being blacker than the whites have ever been white, whatever we wish to. We can project all of that on the level of rhetoric. But what the visual tells us is that the story is far more complicated, more nuanced, far more subtle, far more full of contradictions, contradictions. far, far, far more challenging than what we have simplified in language and we have put across as the rhetoric of our liberation. Yeah. yeah, the about the art. Yeah. And where does the artwork sit 
where does the artwork sit in this rub up? Is the artwork completely liberated, would you say, in South Africa, uh, a liberated space uh, for the artist? I think increasingly it's being drawn into uh, a straight uh, state governmental thinking. Governmentality is an important concept we, de we derive from Michel Foucault. This mm -hmm. notion of governmentality meaning that uh, there comes a time in the development of a state, a political state, where every element of everyday life uh, is drawn into the service of that state or is shaped by that state. And the aesthetic or art practice or artworks, which have the capacity, the inherent capacity to wriggle out of any uh, categorization, they dribble away, they mm. cannot be entirely pinned down, they're very mm. elusive. They are increasingly being gathered and made into an art of representation, by which I mean they are made to uh, be vessels or vehicles into which we pour a political content. Mm. And we, we say that work is about such and such. Well, is it really just about feminism? Yeah. Is it just about uh, masculinism? Is it just yeah. about gayness? Is it just about being black? There, there are many aspects to vi the visual which cannot be labeled in that simplistic way. And we have often had to read works of art very, very closely and scrutinize them to squeeze out from the minutiae another mm. story altogether from yeah. the one that that yes. work of art has been sold on in the galleries and museums. Yes. So this is one side of it, that interpretation is always an unstable thing. But increasingly, we are living in a world where we want very quick sum ups of the meaning of visual works. Yes. I'm sure you've experienced and you see it all over the show, even maybe the most revealing is the tour guide through a museum where you put on the earphones and it's yeah. all explained to you. You all don't look okay. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and also with the critique being uh, Eurocentric in nature, the very idea of yes. art critique, the valued object of art. Yeah. So it does become Absolutely. an object of uh, that's elevated and it could be a nation building apparatus. Yes. Your visual exactly. symmetry is, yes. is trying to slowly move away from, but yet still needing to conform in certain ways to yes. that. To that. That's a perfect diagnosis mm -hmm. that, you know, it is made into a weapon or into a tool for nation building. So yeah. the agenda is drawn up, political agenda, and art must just simply serve that agenda. Whereas why we value art is that it is a non-cognitive way of experiencing the world. It doesn't follow the lines, the linearity of language and cognition, intellectual yes. cognition, it has its own collage-like, montage-like, you know, use of data yeah. comes yeah. to us that is absorbed in very, very different ways. And we mix and, and order it in different ways in a diversity, a temporal diversity. There's not, not just past, present, future. We have such temporal scramble that, you know, we, we have a different way of experiencing things. And this is increasingly policed and regulated into a kind of uh, straight uh, address to the political agenda. And yes. then you are considered a good artist, you're considered to be right on, you're considered to be, you know, speaking um, yes. this political truth and therefore a wonderful artist, yes. not an artist. I would say you have really become almost like a visual ideologist. This is what you have become. You, you know, you've narrowed down what yep. art can do into simply expressing a, a, yes. a 
you know, it in, in, in this regulated way. Art can also be used to subvert ideology. Exactly. I think that's why we hang on to this value of art, that art has this capacity to mm. elude all categorization and the way it, it refuses the prison house of language and it refuses being imprisoned in concepts given to us by other from outside. Let's call it uh, of center. So yeah. this idea that we can, Africa can be an emergence of not a center, but an entity without any center. Is this, mm. is this just a idealistic approach? Will it ever happen? What do you, what's your feeling? Yeah. Well, I think this is where we have to begin um, bringing in <clears throat> the process of globalization yes. as a factor to understand what yes. is the distribution of power in the world, what is the you know, distribution of production in the world, and therefore are we just simply spouting idealistic pipe dreams when we speak of Afrocentedness and know that maybe it has the value of making us stand up and question mm. to what, it, what degree mm. have we just simply bought into European colonial myths and that to that extent it's very important yes. that we um, affirm our Africanness, affirm our Indianness, whatever, in order to remind ourselves of the vast imperial project that had swept over our continents and cultures mm -hmm. and we, of which we are products. Right. But we, we can't in any way go back to what we were before mm -hmm. the colonial projects yeah. and imperial projects. We are also influenced, but we are critically influenced. We're able mm -hmm. to unpack, we are able to deconstruct. And, and that means that we are much more sensitive to the emergence of a world which in many ways stands between continents mm. that is an experience that learns from Europe, that learns from ancient Africa, ancient India, ancient China, but is always in a process mm. of making itself. It doesn't feel I've now become a new point, a new center. We, we will speak of the world. I mm. think this is where Afrocentrism makes the terrible mistake. Against Eurocentricity, we will pose Afrocentricity. Thank God the Indians are such a chaotic mix of <laughs> cultures, religions, and it's this wonderful splendor of mm. multiplicity that you have in India that yeah. prevents anyone from saying we are the center. We're right. always aware that we are in translation to the other yeah. and that this involves the experience of the untranslatable. Therefore, we can never be totally sure that we are the center of things. Uh, and and I, I felt that as a great hope in my studies with India and so on. And then, of course, I was based in China, uh, curating several, several major things there. And I, I eventually went as a visiting professor uh, for quite a few years to teach a course on James Joyce and Marcel Duchamp. So they were two difficult and very un, uh, you know, uneasy things to get involved. You told me about your experiences in other uh, countries and your time there. Would you consider yourself now a cosmopolitan or you know like a, a citizen of the world how has this contributed to you who you are and and what you do where you are in the world now in London well you know Lucille I think I I, I still tussle with that myself and don't have any neat answer for it because we know that the word cosmopolitan is a deeply problematic term. <laughs> and I worked with, um, you know, Ulrich Beck, who was a great theoretician of our time. We were working on a book together, but he unfortunately had a heart attack and passed away. Oh, no. A year later, I was coming to the University of Pretoria 
to, to give a series of lectures for a year, and I suffered a, a cardiac. And one of the concepts he produced, uh, which he was very keen on, and at the time I was very keen on it too, but less keen as time has passed on, is that globalization produces very high-minded notions of being cosmopolitan. We all feel how wonderful, you know, are in different cultures. But ultimately, you see that that's quite a plastic thing. And it's quite a synthetic um, kind of cosmopolitanism. And what uh, Ulrich began to appreciate more was what he called dirty cosmopolitanism. <laughs> and dirty cosmopolitanism is our capacity to observe how very ordinary people in the local news agent's shop at the vegetable stall has already begun a kind of negotiation space. They live many, many realities on many temporal zones, on many cultural, with many cultural connections. Yeah. And they're in that kind of rough and ready, um, grubby way. There is a, an openness which is closer to what we might understand by cosmopolitanism than with the result that here in Bloomsbury, where I live in London, which was once considered the most English of uh, Englishness, um, has now developed a, a lovely little shop called um, Bloomsbury Halal uh, Shop. <laughs> store. And I began to use this image in this explanation of a dirty cosmos, you know, against what you would imagine halal standing for all the stereotypes you can imagine of Islamic terror, etc, etc. Yes, it stands for that. But it also is a process of translation taking place under our noses with cosmopolitan foodstuffs all around us. And this is why I thought your Chatsworth project was just potentially absolutely fantastic. Whatever you do, even if you don't mention it in your PhD, please write a book on it, do a book on it, because <laughs> it's going to disappear. Uh, your kind of generation has yes. this experience of how it evolved. The book by Ashwin Desai and um, Gulam Vahid on Chatsworth building of a township. Yeah. They have a lot of case studies in there, just average normal people talking about their lives, you know, mm. they didn't do anything in history, they didn't make anything uh, remarkable, but all they had in common was chats, Bloomsbury, yeah. Halal, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Such a contradictory clash of clash yeah. of universes here coming together Absolutely. and 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 chats with was you know like pulling together i mean as much as indian people were united in the fact that they were indian by race we were very diverse but, this yeah. within that microcosm no i fully understand yeah, yeah but you know in in those days we also participated in all sorts of things that we might not have um, in our own immediate family. We participated with our neighbours in all uh, Christian festivals, Muslim festival, whatever was going on, all shared it. Yeah. I remember, I mean, we could never think of Christmas without going to midnight mass. That's the thing I missed in London. London is a very, you know, rough and ready city. It doesn't make much of um, religious life except Diwali. They love oh. Diwali because oh. it's celebrated in a big way in Trafalgar Square. Wow, but we, I wouldn't we, have thought that. But okay. Oh, yes, yes, wow. oh, yes. The, the, the temple in North London is very, very popular. I took uh, an Ethiopian a Coptic Christian church student of mine to, to work with me in the Kochi Biennale. Where, when we started it up, my ex-students from, from Goldsmiths College, and we started the South India BNR. And she, she went to stay in a monastery in uh, one of the ancient Christian communities. Mm. And she was just so ecstatic about the whole experience. Otherwise, in the West, you see, you're always seen as a plastic Christian. You are seen as a copy 
a European Christian or a colonial Christian, colonial yeah. subject. So yeah. how to get over this colonial um, subject? You know, this is a big debate. How to decolonize uh, Christianity itself? You know, how to decolonize it? Yeah. And the colonization of Christianity is not um, not not to be found first of all in in the empire. But first, we have to decolonize. European Christianity. These are currents which express a certain truth. They might come out in a distorted way, they might come out yeah. in an uncomfortable way, but that's a reality we have to face, seeing what is productive in such events. Yeah, I think all of us in, in South Africa have arrived from somewhere, <laughs> and that is something we all have to admit to. That mm -hmm. has always been a bone of contention between black nationalism and the admission that the Khoisan and the San people were there uh, before the Dutch, before the whites, and before the blacks, the Bantu. Now, that historically is the truth. I mean, the cave paintings on yeah. the Drakensberg, everything stands as evidence that they had been a highly cultured, um, community of yeah. uh, inhabitants of Southern Africa who were exterminated partly by the Dutch and dare one say, one has to whisper it, by the Bantu arriving from the north. They too participated in uh, this claiming of the territory yeah. which meant yeah. extermination, erasure of the Khoisan. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, there was a paragraph in my essay on the visual century on that, which they just removed without even consulting me. But I feel this is more um, an attempt for them to shake off any notion of being victimized in history. Do not want to be seen as being subjected first to colonial history and then to the apartheid system. They all want to talk about themselves being global players. I've met a lot of young South African students who've come to England from the end of apartheid and, you know, invited them to lots of um, seminars and events and conferences and so on. Yes. And most of them have turned around to me and said, oh, how come you lived in such a system? We mounted to the best of our abilities. We opposed things. And at that time, we opposed Indianization because it was part of the ethnicization policy of apartheid. We opposed the attempt to make us um, interested in Indian art, Indian culture, Indian languages. I did start study, however, with um, Pandit Vardha Acharyadu. I studied Sanskrit and Hindi yes. with him at university. You, you did it, but you didn't want it to be understood as, um, as you know, following a policy of Indianization. But at the same time, you did it because you wanted to claim that you weren't a second-hand copy of a white person. They weren't creating mm. you in their image mm. of being a mm. civilized, modern citizen mm. of the apartheid state mm. who had no history from which it came. So yeah. it was a very complex, mm -hmm. very tangled situation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had, I had particular connections with Steve Biko when he was a student at the medical college, oh, wow. just down the road from Salisbury Island. Island he visited right. us often. We organized events together in wow. the early days wow. of the Black Consciousness Movement. Yeah. If you look at the figures in the Black Consciousness Movement, it is surprising how many Indians were involved in that. Because that was a stage in the politics when the ANC was banned, all of our parents' generation were in prison or under house arrest. Mm. We were being segregated. We made a visit to um, Ngoya, to the Zulu University, and we established contacts with them as students. And we, you know, we then created the youth movement. We held the first event in the 
Orient Islamic School Hall. Uh, it sounds so contradictory even from today's point of view. And, and so, you know, um, we, we lived in the attempt to open a very closed system. And uh, so these young South Africans who say, how could you allow yourself to live under apartheid? Because they are the products of, you know, the end of apartheid and maybe the liberalization period yeah. or something. And they can't imagine what life was like. Right. They don't believe that there was a separate university for Indians and so on. That's amazing. And when did you leave South Africa, Mike? In, in the 70s. In the 70s. In the mid 70s. And you never lived in South Africa from that point? No. Ever I returned. came back at the end of apartheid. They invited me to give the Biennale lecture. Okay. Johannesburg Biennale. And then, um, as I say, they gave me the Distinguished Professor Award by University of Pretoria. Okay. And I was going to come to, you know, for the re uh, to receive the award and spend a year. But I, I have that uh, cardiac. I can't thank you enough for this. This is going to be mind blowing for my thesis. I'm no, so I'm delighted to have met you, and I am so cheered to think that there is at least one person in South Africa thinking so seriously. I think she's an extremely thinking <laughs> researcher because her questions and her approach seem surprisingly unlike younger researchers uh, that I that I'm getting from all over the world oh, you know, like thank you Japan thank China you. India and they all seem to be you know the cut and paste mentality okay. they find a nice quote and they feel oh wouldn't that be nice in my essay I'm but, so uh, grateful. Uh, thank you for getting in touch mm -hmm. and you know for coming up with such interesting questions and for examining your own history in all of this. Mm. As I say, don't hesitate to put yourself in the center of yes. your research story. That Thank is going you. to be novel and Thank you're you. an artist in the end. So Thank you've got you to so invent much. new ways of thinking and writing. Absolutely. <laughs> And thank you. And stay in touch and let me I know will. how you're getting wrong. I will definitely do yes. so, uh, Professor. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank I'd you. be very interested to see how you shape your thinking further. Thank it's you. It's really good. Much. Thank you very much indeed.